Chapter 18 in the Smart Sales System is focused on email prospecting. The agenda for this, this training module is we're going to focus on some email do's and don'ts. We're going to talk about building your email messages and we're going to talk about sending your emails. And actually, by the way, what, regarding your email messages, what we're talking about here today is email prospecting. So if you're a business owner or really if you're a business owner, there's probably two categories uh, or if you're a marketing manager or sales manager, there's really two categories of emails. I, w I try to divide emails into marketing emails and prospecting emails. Marketing emails are more your uh, corporate emails, informational emails. They look nice, usually sent out from, sometimes sent out from a main company email address or an info email address. The, your prospecting emails are sent out by salespeople, and we're talking about prospecting emails today. So these are salespeople, these are emails for the salespeople, the sales reps on a sales team. And so let's just get started with some quick email do's and don'ts. And first of all, my first email do for you is to start using email templates. If only for the purpose of saving you time by decreasing the amount of time you spend writing emails, uh, I think it's extremely important to use email templates. Time is your most valuable resource. It's the one resource you can't buy more of. The more effective you are at using your time, the more you're likely to increase your sales. And regarding email templates, this is so important and also quite easy in that you are going to face the same situations when you're prospecting. Either you're, you're sending an email to someone who doesn't know who you are. You're sending an email to someone you spoke to for a couple minutes. You're, you need to send an email to someone you just left a voicemail for. You just had an, a meeting or an appointment with someone and you need to send a follow-up email. So these same situations repeat again and again. So why spend time writing out those emails each time? Create email templates. So create a cold, cold email templates. Create follow-up email templates. Create voicemail follow-up emails. Create meeting follow-up email templates. Not only will this help you to save time, but I believe that when you start to use these templates again and again, you're going to basically, instead of rewriting and reinventing the wheel each time you create the, the message, you're going to be building on the same templates and be improving those over time. So the next do that I recommend is, is take a step back and try to understand the prospect that you're sending emails to or that you're creating these email templates for. And some of these we've already talked about before, but in trying to understand the prospect, you need to assume that the people that you're emailing are extremely busy. And, this, and it's just this straightforward that if you're writing emails and you're more aware of how busy the person uh, that you're sending the email to is, that will help you to have more clarity on just how short your email message should be you should also be fully aware that you're not the only salesperson sending emails to your prospect. If your prospect did not receive other emails from salespeople, you could be less careful about the email that you send because your email is in a daily stream of incoming emails to the people that you're emailing. Uh, you need to be aware of that and that should impact what you say and how you design your email. The other thing is is that you need to be aware that humans don't primarily care about their own stuff. You care about your own stuff as a salesperson. You care about your product, your company that you, you work for, the product you want to sell, closing sales. Your prospect doesn't care about those things because your prospect cares about their own stuff, like their own job their own goals and objectives at the company they work for. They're, they care about their own company, their own improving the sales and results and performance of their own company. It's very likely that you're about to send an email to someone and if you ha knew that that person was researching for the product that you sell, that then you could probably be a little less careful about how you craft your message. But the reality is, is that it's probably most likely that they're not in buying mode for what you sell. So you need to be aware of that when you're figuring out what to email and what to say. 
And because of some of these things, some of these things like your prospects are busy, they get a lot of emails from salespeople, they care about their own stuff, they're not in buying mode, they're probably getting a lot of emails that aren't sales related, meaning emails from internal resources, internal projects, employees that report to them, and whatnot. So you can just assume that your prospect deletes a lot of the emails they receive without being read. That's extremely important for you to be aware of because there's a good chance that they could delete your email without reading it. So while that is what it is, and it's something for you to be aware of, uh, it should play a key role in your email prospecting. You wanna send an email, you have a product or products to sell, so it's most likely that your natural instinct with sending this email and the way you're creating it is that you're, you really wanna design an email that gets the prospect to read the email so they hear your message that you want to tell them. And you probably want the prospect to reply to the email that you're going to send to them. And ultimately you want the prospect to buy your product. I think it's just safe to assume that if you're really not looking at the big picture and you're putting together your email, these are the things you really want to accomplish. And that's just your natural instinct, being a human and also being a salesperson that has a quota to hit and commissions you want to make. Now, what I want you to do is realize that while that's your natural instinct, there's another thing for you to focus on. And that thing is, is that if prospects delete emails very quickly, instead of thinking about how can I get the prospect to read my message and to reply to my email, maybe you could just focus on what can I do to prevent the prospect from del instantly deleting my email? And it might not even, even be that you're trying to get them to read your email for an extended period of time, but if you can just decrease how quickly they delete your email, well, that is a huge improvement. It, it's of course not a direct connection to your goal of selling your product, but it is a big improvement and the reality is, is that if we go back to the goal of getting the prospect to read the email or to reply or even to buy the product, the, the, the formula and, and design and decisions that have to be made to be successful with that is very complicated and it's very difficult not to say it's impossible, not to say you should give up on it or not ever think about that, but it is very difficult and, it, and the, the formula is maybe unique for every different product you sell and every different salesperson and every different prospect. So it's just a very complex side. You know, the reality is, is on the other side, it's pretty straightforward and easy to figure out small things you can do to decrease your prospect from instantly deleting your email. So what I'm gonna talk about here today we're gonna to talk about some things that help on the left side with getting prospects interested and, and educating them. And it, But a lot of what I'm gonna focus on is communicating in a way so that your prospects just don't instantly delete your message and that you're just dead as soon as you're getting out of the water. Moving through some more email do's and don'ts, these are gonna apply directly to that. And so the first one is don't do everything you can to not motivate the instant delete. So we call this the instant delete, which is basically the pro your prospect looks, maybe they only rate, read the subject line, maybe they just glance at your email for two seconds and they instantly delete it. So what can we do to help with that? Well, the first thing is, is you want to be as brief as possible with your email. And, you know, a lot of this has to do with your prospect is extremely busy. So put yourself in the shoes. If you can think back to when you were in uh, school as a child, do you, re do you ever recall getting a reading assignment and looking at how long it was? How, how many pages are in the chapter? Uh, how many pages are in the book that you have to read? Picture your prospect thinking like that. And that if your email is long, and, and it doesn't even have to be the word count, it could even be, how it looks, like if you don't put enough spacing and you have everything in large paragraphs, the email could look longer. So not only do you want to use brevity and, and, and word count, 
you also want to use brevity in how your the layout and design of your sentences and paragraphs. I would just tell you be as brief as possible and what you might want to do is type out the email that you want to send and then look at it and what I recommend is look at your emails in the same way that you might try to pack a suitcase for a long business trip. If you've ever taken like a two-week trip you'll know that you really have to be smart uh, about what you take. You can't take uh, enough shirts and sho shoes and pants for uh, every day of your trip. You're going to need to reuse some stuff, you're going to need to get creative, and you're not going to you're going to need to be careful not to bring stuff that you have a low probability of using. So I would want you to look at the words in your email in the same way because most likely you can say a sentence in the exact same way with less words if you just try to be more careful and and really look at it or there might be a sentence that you can remove by just really thinking do I really need that do I really need to say that in order to get my point across because your prospects are getting bombarded with prospecting emails cold emails from salespeople all day every day you want to do everything you can to not sound like a salesperson that's trying to sell something if they think you're just the next salesperson and all you're trying to do is sell your product to them and push something on them that motivates the instant delete so anything you can do to decrease that I'm not saying that you should lie or be manipulative but there are things that you can do to sound more like a business person or a consultant rather than a pushy product pushing salesperson and it's okay to be a representative of a company to present the fact that you probably have a, a product or service that you would like to present to them or represent at some point but that's different than being a product pusher and we're going to talk about that here today, but every chapter of the smart sales system will help you with that. One way to not sound like a salesperson and one way to continue to try to understand the prospect is I told you that the prospect is, is human and humans care about their own stuff. You care about selling your product. The prospect doesn't really care about buying your product. They care about improving their job, their company, their life. So with that, instead of making the email all about you, make the email all about the prospect. I've used an example in the past, like think about if you had a hobby and you went, you were with a friend and your friend does not share that hobby with you. Let's say you play golf and you're with a friend and your friend likes to play tennis and you don't play tennis. If you want to be less boring and improve the odds of your friend enjoying your company and if you're going to talk about a sport you can improve your odds of being successful with that by talking about tennis or playing tennis the, the sport that you don't play because if you force your friend to talk about or play golf what they don't play they're more likely to be bored less engaged and be less interested in getting back together with you so force your, your interactions to be more about the other person, what the other person cares about. And with your prospect, that's going to be their job, their company, and their interests. We're talking about email prospecting here. Do what you can to prevent your email from looking like a mass email. So to give you an analogy here or a metaphor uh, to compare this to, imagine, close your eyes or uh, figuratively close your eyes, and picture yourself going to your mailbox at your home and checking the mail. Most likely you will open the mail and there will be promotional, what you would typically call junk mail in the mailbox. And I am probably pretty sure that you throw away most of those items pretty quickly. You don't open them up and read them, even if they're in an envelope. I mean, consider, picture an envelope of, of junk mail versus like a, a two-sided direct mail advertisement picture like an envelope if the envelope is professionally printed with the address printed your address printed you might look at it look at who it's from and you might end up just not even opening it tearing it in half and throwing it away and the reason why you were able to be confident in that is because it was professionally printed and you, you knew that it was a mass email and if you a, a mass piece of mail and if you did not know who it was from you knew that it was going to be, you weren't going to miss anything by throwing it away. Well, now picture re 
looking at an envelope with your address handwritten and you look at the return address and you don't know who it's from but that's handwritten too. Do you rip this up and throw it away? I'm probably sure you do not. I'm probably sure because it's handwritten you're going to open it up and the reason why is because someone specifically wrote something out and mailed you something so it must be something important or could be interesting or you shouldn't throw it away because it's a one-to-one -one piece of mail. You need to have that same mindset with your email. So if your email looks like a mass email, you're gonna, your prospect is going to be more confident in instantly deleting the message. And so some things that make your email look like a mass email, of course, if there's like a more graphics or a border or images or hyperlinks or formatting, it's more likely an email, a mass email. And the logic here is, is, is the same as the envelope being professionally printed. If someone takes the time to make an email look very cosmetically appealing, then it's less likely that it's a one-to-one -one email. It's just the exact same thing as a professional uh, piece of physical mail. So with that, even if you are sending a mass email, try to make it look like it's uh, a one-to-one -one email. So a quick example here is that even if you are using links, which I do recommend in your email prospecting so you can track your prospect clicking on links. With most email software, you can make easily make hyperlinks. Well, what I do when I make hyperlinks is I actually make the hyperlink look like a website address in the same way that when you, you know when you type out a, like www.google.com and if you hit space, it turns it into a link. Well, even if you're inserting a link into a, your email, instead of making it a link text, make the text actually the URL. So if you, I don't know if you're, that makes sense to you, but it's basically making your hyperlinks look like you just typed out an e a, a website address instead of doing hyperlinks. It makes it more like the handwritten envelope. Don't sell the product, sell the meeting. So something we talked about uh, in a previous chapter when we talked about sales process was the first step in the sales process is the initial contact. From there, you're progressing to the meeting, and from the meeting, you're progressing to the presentation. The first step, when you are sending your email prospecting message, you are at the initial contact. So the next step is the meeting. So if you send an email message that's kind of designed around, this is the product I sell, do you need what I sell, you're really tr trying to, you're skipping both of the steps of the, me the meeting and the presentation, and you're just selling the product. And you can greatly improve the effectiveness of your email messages and your email prospecting if you focus on selling the meeting instead of selling the product. And so I'm going to show you some email examples and I'll show you what that looks like. Because your prospects are busy and because they get a lot of messages from salespeople and non-sales related messages, you're going to need to reach out to your prospects multiple times. It's just good to have an approach that includes multiple prospecting email messages. Uh, not only should you plan on sending each prospect multiple messages, but you should probably plan on reaching out to them in different ways as well. So we're talking about email prospecting here. In the last chapter, we talked about cold calling. So you should bring those two things together and there should also be voicemail messages. You could also include social media reach out, outreach. You could also include direct mail pieces. But to make your email prospecting more successful, you should, one, have multiple emails going out to each prospect and also have different types of communication as well. Because we are going to reach out to our prospect multiple times and getting back to the email messages, since we're going to send multiple emails out to each prospect, what we can do is we can use those messages to try to educate the prospect. And because we're, we're not trying to talk to them about our product or sell our product, we can educate the prospect on who we are and why it might make sense for them to talk to us at some point. And we can connect that with their interests of, you know, their goal, their, their interests of improving their company, improving their job, improving their life. And so the story that you have that applies to that, you can break that story up uh, into smaller individual stories or individual messages 
and then spread that those out over multiple messages and use that set of stories or that set of messages to educate the prospect on who you are and why they should talk to you at some point. I want you to not be apologetic. So they might say something like, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. I know you're busy. I won't take too much of your time. And so when they're saying stuff like that, first of all, you don't need to apologize to them. I mean, they're a business person and operating in the business world. I mean, if, if, we, if we apply this to B2B sales, they're a business person operating in the business world. You're a business person. You have nothing to apologize for by interacting with them. You're not being rude. But if you do everything in a respectable way, you don't have anything to apologize for is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, is that b apologizing is a very weak frame of mind. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a firm believer if you make a mistake, if you do something wrong, uh, or if you don't know the answer to something, be very quick to either apologize or admit that you don't know the answer. Uh, but when you're doing outreach, whether it's email or cold call, you haven't done anything wrong. So there's nothing to apologize for. And uh, I'll, you know, picture if you had a bag of money. If you found a bag of money that someone lost and you're trying to find who it belonged to or or to make that more real, if you found a wallet that was on the ground and you're trying to figure out who it belonged to, would you be apologetic when you're going and interrupting people to see if the wallet belongs to them? Most likely you would not be, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I won't, I'll, I won't take too much of your time. Uh, can, can you do me a favor and listen to what I have to talk to you about? No, you wouldn't because you know what you found is of tremendous value to the person that it belongs to. So you would be very confident in what you have to offer. Now the thing is that when you're in product selling mode, you begin to forget about how valuable what you have is because you're trying to push it on everybody and you're facing a lot of rejection and you're trying to sell to people that don't need what you sell. So you forget that what you have is so valuable. When you really are aware of the value that, of what you sell, you will realize that it's the, it's the equivalent of the finding a wallet or finding a bag of money for the person that needs what you sell. So don't apologize for anything, or don't apologize for your outreach, should I say. The other thing that I notice is, and, and I don't know why salespeople do this, but don't question the prospects in your emails about the status of them reading or responding to their pre your previous messages that you sent them. For example, you say, hey, did you see my last email? Did you read my last email? You never replied to my last email. I never heard back from you. I don't, I don't know why salespeople do this. And if you, if you know why salespeople do this, I, let me know in the chat window because I'm very curious because I don't understand what there is to be gained from sending this. I'll just send, I'm going to show you four quick examples. We don't have to dissect these emails. But look at this. Did you ever receive my email about candidates we have to offer? These are real emails that I've received. I just copied and paste, pasted them. What, what is there to gain by knowing that I, if I've received the other emails? I didn't reply to them. If they want to email me again, email me again. It, it doesn't matter whether or not I saw them. I mean, what is me seeing them? If I answer that question, does that give that salesperson any information that they can perform some certain direct action or take a different direction? So, and this also I think is weak because you're reminding me that I haven't replied to your email messages. Just reach out with confidence. Hey, it's me. You know, and if, what I recommend is don't even acknowledge the, the previous emails. Uh, you can build on the, the previous emails from your storytelling, but don't even acknowledge them. I mean, you could say, I'm, I'm following up with you again, or uh, just to kind of tie the emails together, but don't put the, hey, uh, here, I'll give you another example. I just wanted to see if you caught my last message. What, what, is, what does that accomplish? If anything, this is almost a wasted email. This is an example of the, the salesperson just doesn't have anything to say. So basically, I get my assumption here would be they have nothing to say, so they're using the, the, the question of, did you see my last email, my other emails, as the reason for reaching back out, which 
why not just send another email? You have a lot to tell in your story. So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna show you email messages to where you'll have multiple emails to send so you won't have to send an email like this. But I just want to touch base since I didn't hear back from you. I mean, just a really weak uh, opening. I have I have reached out to you the last few weeks with no reply. Oh, okay, well, you're reminding me that I didn't reply to your other email, so I guess I should maybe, there's probably a reason why I shouldn't reply to this one. So I'm probably beating a dead horse there, but I, I just, I see it so much that I, I just want to be sure to cover that. So those are the do's and, some do's and don'ts. Now let's talk about building your email messages. And the first thing I kind of talked about uh, if you're a product selling salesperson uh, a few minutes ago, uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> if you're a product selling salesperson, you're, you're probably going to end up sending emails that look something like this. This is who I'm with. This is what we sell. This is how what it does or how it works. Maybe you might talk about this is where how to, it costs or how what the purchase is like. And most likely, your message is focused on the goal of trying to close the sale. So I'll give you an example of what one of these emails looks like. Now, this is a fictitious email that I just put together. But hi, Michael. I'm with Websites Redesign for you, and we provide website redesign, digital marketing, pay-per-click advertising, search engine optimization. Are you looking to redesign your website? Let me know when you're available for a 20 to 30 minute meeting where we can discuss how our services work. I left a word off there at the end. So, and that's the entire email. Now, to be honest with you, this is the structure of emails I get every day. Honestly, they're, they're usually longer than this. So I'm, I'm being actually generous to the, to the salespeople that send me these emails because there's usually more product information and more company information but the flow is very common. This is who I work with for, this is what we sell. And then here's a big thing regarding, I said that the product selling salesperson focuses on closing the sale. Are you looking to redesign your website? So that question is, to, is completely aligned with the goal of closing the sale. Even knowing I can't reply to the email and say, yes, I want to purchase. We would need to talk. We would need to meet. There would be paperwork, whatever. But that question is aligned with, this is what I sell. Do you need what I sell? Yes or no, right? And this is extremely common. So the, 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 the reality is, is, well, going back to the previous tip of don't sell the meeting, sell the product. This is totally an example of selling the product. So um, I'm going to show you some examples that don't do this, but while we're looking at this, this does a few, this breaks a few rules. One is it's all about the salesperson. The salesperson cares about selling their product. When they, if they were to sell me any of these services, they would make money. That excites them. They're really excited to tell me about what they sell and the meeting they want to schedule is for them to tell me about what they sell and to tell me all about them. This email is not about me at all. So just a few, a few of the don'ts and do's that are, are broken or this doesn't align with. But, well, by the way, it's very understandable to, sell, to send emails like this because this aligns with your natural instincts. This is what you care about. This might even also be what you've been trained to do or trained on because if you've been trained on your product and then you're given a territory, you need to go generate leads and now you're gonna send emails to generate leads, you're gonna talk about the stuff you've been trained on, which is the product. So it's very understandable. Now let me give you the other option and the other way to create uh, other emails that might be another option for you. And it goes back to the consultative selling sales message, which is what we discussed in chapter three, which instead of talking about the company and the product, we're gonna focus on the improvements that the product delivers for the buyer that we're targeting, we're going to focus on the prospect's pain points that we can help to resolve. We're going to focus on questions that look to see if the prospect needs what we sell in terms of having the pain points that we solve. We might share a customer example of someone else we've helped. And we can get into product details. My advice would be, well, regarding the consultative selling sales message, 
it's not at some point you do you do want to talk about the product but the go, the logic here is let's talk about the prospect first and then talk about the product later what that looks like in a in a cold call is we're going to spend most of the cold call on the prospect and the end on the product just enough so we can sell the, the prospect on talking in the form of a meeting what this looks like in an email series is that we we might get to talk about the product in one of our later emails because remember we're going to tell a story over a series of emails and it's not and maybe one of the later emails we can get to the product but even when we get to the product you can notice that we're a little more sophisticated when we talk about the product versus the other side where it's this is the company I work for this is what I sell when we talk about the product or on the consultative selling side yeah we're, we might get into some features but we're going to talk about how we're different we, we could talk about ROI we can deliver we're going to talk about some company bragging points and whatnot so and instead of do you need what I sell yes no it we're more focused on trying to close the prospect on starting the conversation or selling the prospect on moving to the next step of our sales process let's build some email messages I'm going to show you some email message examples that you can use first we need some topics or how to divide our consultative selling sales message across a series of emails well guess what we can use that exact same list and we could create an email for each item here so we could create a benefits email a pain points email uh, a name drop email and whatnot let's talk about subject lines so a big question that comes into me is what are good subject lines to use what are good subject lines that get prospects to open the emails what are good subject lines that get prospects to to reply to your emails well first of all to answer that question notice that a few of those questions are aligned with the stuff that I said is really difficult right it's really difficult to figure the magic uh, recipe that gets the prospect to read the email it's really difficult to get the reply well what we could do is focus on creating email subject lines that decrease the instant delete right if there are subject lines that a, a prospect sees and they have confidence to instantly delete it that's bad so if we can minimize it, mistakes on that side then then what that does is that might not get the prospect to see the subject line and open the email but it, it keeps us in the game so that we're we're our email still alive and then we can uh, get then hopefully the prospect will open the email because they haven't instantly deleted it so we're almost looking for subject lines that are a little bit more benign meaning they're just kind of neutral maybe they even describe the general area that we're coming from like we don't want to be totally vague and we don't want to be too um, promotional or too salesy so something in the middle something that kind of just generally says what we're reaching out about and what works great is that same list so we could use a value point for a subject line a pain point that we help to solve for a subject line a point about how we're different for a subject line so the same list of, that we use to create our email messages those individual points usually make good subject lines as well so let's go through I have a handful of email messages I, I can share with you so an email message a cold email that's designed around your value points building block might look something like this so the subject line we just stick one of our value points in the subject line so uh, like a, a value point for for my services and my product is uh, decreasing sales staff turnover I could use as a subject line decreasing sales staff turnover just that no no exclamation points no no uh, emoticons just just that no all caps <clears throat> and so let's look at what an email might look like hello contact first name the reason for the email is we help sales managers to decrease uh, sales staff turnover improve the improve reps ability to generate leads and new accounts improve the sales performance of the sales team overall I don't know if you want to improve any of those areas and that's why I'm reaching out are you available for a 15 20 minute meeting where I can share some examples how we've helped other uh, VPs of sales to decrease sales staff turnover 
Best regards, Michael Halper. So just to look at this real quick, very economical on the word count. You might even look at that and say, ah, it's kind of plain. It's plain by design. We have plenty of information to share, but, and this is where most salespeople go wrong, is they put everything they want to say in one email and then it's extremely long. Then that email gets instantly deleted just because it was long. Then they don't, the salesperson doesn't have anything left to say in email two. So then they end up sending the email message of, did you receive my last email? Let me know if you have time to meet as their email number two. So we don't need to say everything because we know we're, there's more emails coming. So this is just part of the story. This is the value part of your story. Uh, the other thing is, is that there's a, there's a sales takeaway here, which is I don't know if you want to improve those areas. So we've, talk, we've talked a little bit already in, in the smart sales system about sales takeaway. We're going to drill into uh, the logic behind doing a takeaway towards the end when we talk about closing. But this is a very good touch to kind of decrease the guardedness of the prospect. And then there's the close of going for the, the, the meeting, not asking if they need what they sell. By the way, if you go for the meeting, uh, you greatly increase the odds of a fit and a match versus going for the close of does, does the salesperson, does the prospect need what I sell today? If we go back to the website design, service if you're saying do you need what I sell today what you're doing is you're creating a very small target there might be a large pool of prospects that you could that have a reason to talk to you but if your question is do you need what I sell today you greatly shrink that target and you make it very specific so by going for the meeting not only is that a more logical thing to talk to close for because that's the next thing we're not going to I'm not going to sell to you over email the next step is to talk so let close for the talking not only is it more logical uh, not only is it less pushy and less sales and product pushing but it, it also increases the target because you're less specific about what you're trying to close for cold email pain points almost the exact same email just uh, changing out the value points for pain points and a few other words are changed. We help sales managers with the challenges of pain point one, two, three. I don't know if you are concerned about any of those areas and that's why I'm reaching out. Same close and whatnot. So that's the pain points email. We can use your name drop building block. The subject line is maybe uh, the improvement that you delivered for a previous customer. Hello, uh, Mary. The reason for the email is we worked with XYZ Corp and helped them to uh, decrease their sales staff turnover by 25%. This ultimately helped them to improve their overall sales by 13%. I don't know if you, we can help you in that same way, and that's why I'm reaching out. Sales takeaway, same close. Are you available for 15, 20 minute meeting? Best regards. Name drop a uh, cold email. This is a pain questions e cold email. Now, I will admit that this is not a strong email, and if you were only going to send one email, you would not send this email by itself. But if you've already sent the previous emails, and this is email number four, it's an okay email, and it's better than just the, hey, did you see my last emails? So this email goes something like this. Uh, I'm trying to determine if we can help you in the same way we've helped other clients. These are some of the questions I would ask you to figure that out. And then there's your pain questions. Do any of those connect with a challenge or interest that you have? If so, let's put a few minutes on the calendar for a brief conversation. Best regards. This is email number five. And this is a, now we're getting to the product, right? So we've maybe we haven't had a reply yet. So now we're just going to just start to get to the what we're interested in talking to them about. We try to make it about them. Now we're going to make it about us. The reason for the email is we provide product, and that includes feature one, feature two, feature three. Some ways we differ from other options out there are differentiation one, two, three. Are you interested in a 15, 20 minute meeting? Best regards. So it's we're getting into some product details here, but at least we waited before we hit them with that. And then 
we are focusing on more sophisticated broad product details by getting to the differentiation. This is just a template. So if you have certain things about your product, I mean, maybe it might not make sense for you to mention features. Maybe you have different products or services you want to mention. This is just a template for you to build on. Here's a last attempt email. So maybe you've sent those other five emails and you still haven't heard back. So this might be your, your walk away message. Subject line checking in. Never heard back from you. I thought I would follow up with you one last time. The reason I'm trying to connect, the reason I'm reaching out is that we help other VPs of sales with here's some benefits. If I don't hear back from you, I'll assume you're not interested in those improvements or that you aren't the right person to speak with and I'll close the file. If I should be contacting someone else regarding this, any pointing in the right direction would be greatly appreciated. Best regards and whatnot. Now, so those are six cold emails you could send. Now, I do want to point out, I mentioned to you, don't sell the product, sell the meeting. I do recognize that there, every salesperson's unique. So your situation might be unique and some of our tips you might take and some of them you might disregard. And with that, I will recognize that some salespeople sell a very commonly sold product. And there's no real, there's no sophistication to the sales process. There's no reason to have any meetings. You are just blasting people and looking for the people that need what you sell right now. And I call this the keep me in mind email. So it's basically you're sending an email, letting them know what you sell and sending this so that they keep you in mind because you know that they buy it from time to time and you want them to have your info. So here's what this email looks like. Keep us in mind and then maybe put a hyphen or a dash and then what you sell. Since you are a VP of sales, you might need or purchase and then insert what you sell from time to time. We provide that, so please keep us in mind when you're ready to make a purchase or a change. Some ways we differ from other options out there are differentiation one, differentiation two, differentiation three. Let me know if you reach a point where you would like to put a brief call to discuss. Best regards and then your signature. Now you could even coach them. I wanted to keep this email brief, but there's a version of this where I've even included in the bottom. If you can hang on to this email or store it away in your vendor folder, uh, that way you can keep us in mind when you're ready to make a change, something like that. So you're, co you're coaching the prospect to keep you in mind. Now, I personally believe in using the other emails where you're selling the meeting, you're trying to build start a conversation versus this. But if you just want to uh, do the, do you need what I sell today? Uh, this is a good email for that. So moving on to actually sending some of these email messages. Uh, and here are some tips. I showed you six e a six email series basically. And I told you that you're gonna need to send multiple emails to each prospect in order to increase the odds of you connecting, getting engaged and whatnot. So here's a way to string those emails together. We refer to emails that are strung together as we call those email threads. So here's an email thread with one email each, each an email each week or two. Uh, the decision here on whether it's one week or two, week, two weeks in between emails is if you're gonna do any calling. If you're doing calling, uh, I recommend two, two weeks in between emails and we'll talk about how to mix these with calls uh, in, uh, in a couple chapters coming up and when we talk about getting in, how to get into new accounts because you'll do calls and voicemails in between these emails and it'll all fit together real nicely. But if you're not doing any calling and you're just doing email prospecting, I would do one week between email messages. I highly recommend you use some sort of tool to automate the delivery of your emails. I would recommend you use tools to automate as much as you can of the sales process and your sales activities. Email delivery and email scheduling is one of the easiest things to automate. There's plenty of tools out there on the market where you can load up a set series of email templates, load up a list of prospects, send out a mass blast, do email scheduling, schedule a series and whatnot. So I highly recommend you look into uh, 
some sort of tools for that. Any tools you, you subscribe to and use for email automation will usually provide tracking capability. So they'll, they'll provide tr tracking of email opens and email clicks. When I say clicks, I'm referring to prospects clicking on links. So I would recommend that you include links in your emails. Links, not links to like, hey, here's a link to buy my product, but links like, you know, if you're talking about uh, a set of value and set of improvements, maybe you have a link to a case study or a link to a news article that are that that is related to the message that you're sending. So you're very informational and, and delivering value to your prospects. I recommend including those so that when your prospects click on those links, you can know you'll be notified through your tracking who's clicking on your emails and those will be your your prime prospects to call. If, if you're if you're mixing call, cold calling with email prospecting, when you have the data of email opens and clicks, you can make much better decisions on who to call. Uh, for example, you you might be able to do some form of lead scoring. So like this is actually a screenshot taken from Sales Scripter, and you can see on the far right the, there are there's a column for quality points. We actually use a lead scoring system called Quality Points where we give points for email opens and email clicks. So as you're emailing prospects over a period of time, you're going to see who you should be calling because they're going to have the most quality points. This actually this screenshot is actually from my list of people who have attended uh, webinars. I have a list of about 4,000 people that have attended webinars. And you would think that that list is a great list that, uh, for a salesperson to work, right? and, and it is a great list. But 4,000 is a lot of people to reach out to. And if, I, if we did not do any form of lead scoring, the, a salesperson would just start at the top of the list and work their way to the bottom and not know which people to call out of the 4,000. Well, you, this lead scoring, you can see here that this is the top of the list, and there's these prospects have hundreds of points and so uh, we can easily look at this list and the lead scoring and make and call the best prospects there's actually prospects at the bottom of the list with negative quality points and zero quality points and we know that we should never spend a minute calling any of those prospects and or at least not until we've called all the others and uh, but without that data we wouldn't be able to have we wouldn't be able to make that decision the last thing I'll talk to you regarding uh, sending emails and regarding email prospecting is just the scheduling of your emails so um, the only thing I would factor in is you want to send your emails if you're doing b2b email prospecting you want to send your emails when your prospects are at their are most likely at their desk and uh, most likely checking email. The reason why is, for example, if you send your, your email after hours, one of two things is likely to happen. Either A, they check your, they read your email on a, on a smartphone because they're not at their desk, which that does one thing. One, one thing is it crams your message onto a smaller screen so your email looks longer than it would on a, maybe their a full desktop laptop so the instant delete will be quicker uh, they're they're away from their desk so just because they're reading on their phone they might not give it the full attention they would if then if they were out at the at work the other thing is, is that it, it, your email might get into a queue of unread emails for example like if your email sent overnight and your prospect gets into the office and they're then looking at all the emails that came in your email might be one of many emails and then your the instant delete trigger on your, your prospect's finger on their mouse will be much uh, quicker. You know, they're going to click through all, I mean, just think about how, you, how quickly you delete emails when you wake up in the morning or when you first check your email versus an email that comes in and maybe at a moment when you're caught up on email or you're waiting to go to lunch and uh, and have more time to kill. So just something to think about. I think I personally think that between eight to nine, eight to nine or eight to ten in the morning is a good time to schedule email prospecting email to schedule prospecting emails. 
And then after lunch, between 1 to 2 are good times to schedule emails. Uh, certainly if you have just if you're just sending an email one off here or there uh, anytime during business hours is probably okay so that's about it uh, oh wait one one last thought uh, if you're doing email prospecting and you're sending emails you're gonna need email addresses not really revolutionary rocket science there uh, you can certainly buy email lists you can uh, some people establish connections with prospects on LinkedIn to get email addresses. I actually advise against that and I talk about that in the chapter uh, on LinkedIn prospecting. But the good news is, is that you there's an 80% chance that you can guess your prospect's email address if you're doing B2B selling because your pro if you know who your if you know your prospect's name and you know where they work, then their e their business email address will be some combination of those three values. And so the, the, this list here are, is the most common combinations of those three values. And you can literally try a few of these and most likely, well, where this comes from is when I was doing, when I was selling to like executive level uh, prospects in my past life, um, I knew I would have that information pretty re easily on a website or in financial documents and I would basically just guess their email address and after about three or four guesses uh, what happens when you guess wrong is a lot of times the email will bounce back and if you give it another two or three guesses you usually will have an email that doesn't bounce back sometimes the email doesn't bounce back and your emails wrong that's why I say 80 percent of the time this works but uh, but this works, and it is a way to get email addresses. Now, I will say it's a bit cumbersome. So if you have a list of a 1,000 businesses you're trying to sell to uh, or whatnot, this, this is, might be too cumbersome for you, or uh, it could just be a little bit tedious for your level of patience. One good thing is we actually have a tool in Sales Scripter called the Email Guesser that actually takes your three val the three values, first name, last name, company website address and goes through all those combinations and does a test ping sends out a test ping into the wor world of the internet out to MX database records and figures out which email address is good and will show you the results uh, it'll get the email guesser will tell you which email address is good for that particular prospect so this works really good especially if you use LinkedIn on LinkedIn you can get those three values and about 60 seconds or less you plug them in here and you can get their email address without becoming LinkedIn connections not only does that save you the step of becoming LinkedIn connections but it actually gives you their business email address versus their personal Gmail uh, email address so that which is more valuable so you might want to check that out